my name is Mike Gaben and welcome to my KSP campaign. What we have here is the Arm E2 launched last episode and is now just leaving Kerbin's sphere of influence in its effort to chase down a D-class asteroid. And it is ready to make its first correction burn now to close up that encounter distance. Okay, got about 21 meters per second, gets me a 100 meter closest approach, with an encounter speed of 688 meters per second. This encounter is going to happen about five days from now, and we'll be getting to that very shortly in this episode. I'm showing this a bit out of order. This burn actually occurred just before the Kegel 4 and the Moon Harvester landed on the moon, which is what concluded last episode. I just felt it better here though as this asteroid mission is going to be the main theme of this episode. That said, we shouldn't forget about our brave crew on the surface of the moon. While the moon harvester is gathering and refining ore, Shao Kal is taking the opportunity to collect science here in the moon's northern basin. You know, this would be an excellent location for a moon base. The ore is more concentrated here than anywhere else on the moon. And rather than hauling that ore up into orbit, as you saw me do a couple of episodes ago, it would make far more sense to refine the fuel here and have a dedicated lander to ferry the fuel up to an orbiting station. You can then use that fuel to support moon landings to really mine the heck out of the science in the moon's biomes. And as tempting and fun as that would be, it's not going to be in this series that that is going to happen. My plan is to be wrapping this series up, and I'm not designing any new vessels, so I have no use for the science anyway. So I made the decision that once Yoy Station was once again overhead, we would be starting these boys back on their journey home. My transfer window back to Kerbin came two days later, and as luck would have it, it was right around the same time as the Arm E2 was rendezvousing with its asteroid. I've got about a half an hour warning on this rendezvous, so I should be able to get this burn in. Of course, it was right after this it was over to the Army too. We're now less than 15 minutes from our closest approach, and our relative velocity is still around 700 meters per second. I've got to do something about this. Now the asteroid is coming up behind me. As it's going faster than me, a good part of this burn is going to be prograde relative to the sun. A good way to set this up is to point yourself retrograde relative to the target. You want the maneuver node icon to be on your retrograde vector relative to the target. So I'm using the normal and radial components of the burn to pull the maneuver icon to where I want it to be. It is a bit finicky, and it's not unusual to lose the encounter entirely as the two orbits around the sun are already very similar. Ah, this will knock off more than half of my relative velocity with my closest approach under 100 meters. Let's punch it. As you can see, I'm using the remote tech flight computer for this burn. It's only about a half second light delay, but even that amount of lag is a bit annoying. I repeated the process one more time a little closer to get my relative velocity under 100 meters per second when I was just within 100 kilometers of the target. From here on in, I did my burns manually, though I continued to use the flight computer to adjust my attitude. I just found putting in the numbers for pitch and heading easier than dealing with the light lag. Before long, I was just a few hundred meters away and approaching at just a meter per second. Time to get ready to attach. I'm going to have the SAS point at the center of mass of the asteroid. Due to this, make sure to right click on the asteroid and select target the center of mass. You may be noticing that the asteroid is rotating thanks to the persistent rotation mod, but it rotates about the center of mass, so the actual center of mass of the target shouldn't move. I'm not going to be too picky about where I actually latch on. I know my approach is slow, but it's easy enough just to time warp to speed things up. Don't be thrown by the distance indicator on the asteroid, as it's targeting the center of mass, not the surface of the asteroid. I'm just using RCS to keep my prograde vector onto the target icon on the nav ball. Oh, this is looking just fine. And... 
patched. Alright, so there's another hurdle behind us. Uh, let's see here. Oh, why don't we, uh, why don't we turn the lights off actually first? Though with the, uh, interstellar extended Nerva engines on this thing, electricity is not an issue. And then, uh, you might be seeing there I got three reaction wheels at the front to help sort of move this asteroid around and get it onto the attitude that I want, though you can tell as well I'm getting a kind of a wobble happening to help keep that under control. I turned the SAS off. But it's time to adjust my encounter with Kerbin. Now I'm currently on a collision course, so I have to fix that. But I do want to take a shot at arrow breaking the asteroid again. I know, I know, last time things didn't go so well. But I've made some adjustments and would like to see if they're going to work. Just a 12 meter per second burn is all that was required. And I do have a wobble issue. I found if I had the SAS on, the wobble just got crazy. So I'm just keeping it on the maneuver node manually. I thought of using the Remote Tech flight computer, but figured that would probably just have the same problem. So everything is just turned off. I'm going full manual. I do have RCS on to help hold the attitude, but oh my gosh, this is like a fucking Bronco. The maneuver node's getting away on me. I'm trying to chase it, but I can't. Oh, no, 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 I'm losing it. Just cut, 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 cut. forget it, forget it, forget it. I just turn everything off, RCS off, just let it tumble. Okay, let's see what we got here. Okay, it's a periapsis of 33 kilometers. I mean, that's too deep in the atmosphere, but it's close enough for now. I'll tweak this further once I'm in Kerbin's SOI. Meanwhile, the Korion 3, after performing several arrow breaking passes, is now on its final approach to Kerbin Station. Korion, of course, is carrying our brave moon crew. We saw leaving the surface of the moon early in this episode. Now we just need to get them docked and then... Well, hang on. The yaw keeps pulling to the right. I mean, I can pull it to the left, but when I let go, it just goes to the full-on to the right. Let's go to the station, then we'll bounce back. No, it's still doing it. You can see the yaw kind of bouncing back and forth. Okay, let's try just turning off the SAS. Turn it on again. Okay, no, no, still goes to the right when it's on. Just using RCS here to stop me heading towards the station. Okay, there we go. I'm drifting the other way. Okay, abandon ship! <laughs> let's get out of here. These guys are done. I don't even know what I want to do with the Korion 3 anymore. So let's abandon ship. Engineers and scientists first. <laughs> let's get you over there. Let's come on, Wilman. Uh, you know, the, the, the relative velocity with the station is pretty close to nulled out, so it'll sort of stick around here. And maybe just leaving this scene and coming back to it will fix it all up. And in the meantime, let's get the crew over. We're going to take the crew down in my dream chaser that you can see Wilman heading straight for here. We also have a whole army of Kerbals on the station itself. we got to take some of them down as well, but we'll line up Wilman. We'll get him aboard. And then we'll take the Dream Chaser down. Okay, grab on, Wilman. Uh, okay, board. Okay, there we go. Wilman's aboard. All right, back to the Korion. Uh, Shell Cal's last. Pilot should go last. So Shell Cal is next. Let's try and see. If, yeah. Well, it's still it's still just going I mean I got the SAS off now so it's just spinning on its own momentum but as soon as I turn the SAS back on it just keeps spinning to the right Shao Kahlo of course made sure to grab all of that sweet sweet science and then we'll get him aboard between the station and the Korion 3, I have 10 Kerbals in this general vicinity, so I do want to start getting Kerbals down to the surface, start winding this series down. Make sure to leave a couple of pilots aboard the station, though. The pilots still have some ships at their disposal. There's the Korion 1 that you can see there towards the left of your screen. And they also have a Kuryu's 
it's an old vessel of mine, but it's a very versatile vessel. It has some uh, 800 meters per second of delta V. It can do a fair bit. And I'm leaving them there in case they need to chase down any wayward ships. Number one is the Karayan 3, which is behind us, of course. But also, I have two interstellar um, crewed missions that will eventually, hopefully, come back from Eve and from Drez. And you don't know, they might need some support once they get into Kerbin's sphere of influence. It's better, I think, to keep a rescue in handy, handy in space, just in case. All right, Burke, you're the last one. And once I had everybody aboard the station, I did go back to the space center and then returned here to refresh the scene, and that did fix whatever the issue was. So I sent out Starla! who happened to be aboard the station, to rescue the Karayan and bring her in. Honestly, I really should have done this in the first place. I think I just wanted to go through the whole abandoned ship thing. Bringing our Kerbals down to the surface, we have the Dream Chaser. Besides our crew from the moon, we also have McNand and Gene Lee, who are part of the Karayan 1 crew, which returned to the station in episode 119. Still aboard the station, I have two level 3 scientists, Bob and Carol, who are generating 8 science points a day for me in the science lab, as well as my space-time record holder, Bartner, and then two pilots, Valentina and Starla, as I've already mentioned. I think it's a good idea to keep a couple of pilots around. You never know when they might be needed in a pinch. I'm going to be using trajectories here. I'm setting my angle of attack on entry to about 90 degrees. Then in high atmosphere to around 30 degrees. And then my angle of attack comes down to zero while I'm gliding in. I don't know. I think that's relatively close to what I do. <laughs> Longtime viewers of this series likely know that even with trajectories, I am less than consistent when it comes to putting space planes down onto the runway. I'm putting the red cross right onto the KSC. And then as I descend, I periodically checked map view to see how trajectory's prediction was doing. Pitching down if the prediction was coming up short, and up if the prediction was coming out long. It's just that this thing is so frickin' light that I always seem to underestimate how quickly it'll slow down. Ah, I'm coming up short. Let's burn the rest of our propellant to get what speed I can. I'm not sure how much this is going to do. These puff engines are so inefficient in the atmosphere. And nah, it turned out I was going to come out short anyway. Not by too much, but short nonetheless. That said though, landing was, was most definitely a controlled one. Of course, this is really just about pride more than anything else. In the end, the, you know, the when you come this close, the actual penalty in terms of recovery cost is uh, pretty minimal. Really doesn't make a difference. I'll tell you though, this thing does glide well. So oh, there's our shadow. Just blink. There we go. We are down. With that accomplished, well, it's time to get to the moment of truth for this episode. We are just about to take the atmospheric plunge with our asteroid. Oh, jeez, I'm low on monoprop. I best keep an eye on that. Now, I didn't show this to you, but once I entered into Kerbin's SOI, I raised my periapsis to 50 kilometers. Trajectories was still predicting a comfortable capture. I'll also admit that at that point I did a quick save, so that if this doesn't work, I can go back and try it at a higher altitude. Now, if you go back to the first time I did this, I had my periapsis at 37.5 kilometers. That said, if you go back to the clip that I showed a little earlier in this episode from that first attempt, I was getting explosions a little less than 60 kilometers altitude. So just the periapsis change might not be enough. The explosions before were from heating. The rock heated a lot, and that heat transferred very quickly into the vessel. So up the front here, I have a cluster of these edge-on radiators. Here, let's select one so I can keep an eye on it. I'm hoping that this will help protect the vessel from the heat of the asteroid. 
Because of the wobble, I'm controlling this man. Oh, wait a second. What about plasma blackout? No, I best turn on the flight computer. Let's get that to lock it onto the surface. Okay, it's on the orbital prograde vector. I think I do want it on the surface prograde vector. There we go. Not that there's really that much difference. Oh, yeah, we're already getting the wobble. Okay, time warp. I discovered that time warping does stop the wobble. That'll be the last time I can use that trick now that I'm in the atmosphere. Oh, hang on. Can I keep track of heating on the asteroid? What if I right-click on the asteroid? Uh, no, no heat information. Okay. All right, well, from here on in, this thing is going to be on its own. I've turned the RCS off. In fact, I'm going to try not to use the RCS anymore because uh, I, I, I hardly have any monopropellant left. I was using it way, way too much. And I'm keeping an eye on that critical thermal percentage coming at me from Kerbal Engineer. It's telling me what the hottest part is and then what how close it is to exploding. And right now, it is the advanced grabbing unit. Not surprising. That's what's attached to the getting hotter asteroid. We just crossed 30% critical temperature. That's not so bad. And we're less than 10 seconds away from periapsis. Well, that's encouraging. Okay, and there we go. We have just passed periapsis. We are now on our way up. Critical thermal percentage is still climbing, but still under 50%. Nowhere near scary. I routinely, when arrow breaking things like the Karayan, get it up around 75%. So uh, this is still pretty comfortable. Oh my goodness, though, this wobble is getting bad. Please, please, please don't break. The thermal percentage is still climbing, but I, I think we're way out of the danger zone on that. Exploding is not going to be an issue. Oh man, look at our altitude. Oh man, we don't need the SAS anymore. Let's turn off the flight computer. Even if this thing starts to rotate, uh, that's not going to be a problem. We're at 60 kilometers, almost out of the atmosphere. The thermal percentage is almost at 60%. Oh my god, no, the wobble, that's what I'm scared about right now, that this thing's just going to break apart on me. Oh my god, look at that wobble. Oh wait, we're out of the atmosphere. Time warp. Yes, okay, that's it. That's it, okay. Leave everything off. Just let it tumble. We are captured. We are safe. Okay, we got it. All right, we can take a look at the contract here, and we can see we still have one more requirement. Uh, yeah, getting captured around Kerbin wasn't quite good enough. I have to get this thing to Minmus. Okay, we got a relative descending node out over here. Let's take a look. 122 degrees relative inclination. Oh my god, we're going around the wrong way. Okay, we're going to have to flip this orbit around to get this to work. I have 414 meters per second left in the vehicle to play with. Well, let's see what we can do. Now that I do have my capture, I do have the luxury of being able to send resources out here at my leisure. But it would be kind of nice to get this done just with this vessel. After a little bit of playing around, I got this 188 meter per second burn. It's a day and a half away. When I was performing this burn, you know, I, I'm finally starting to learn. I'm going to be a little bit more cautious. I'm trying not to use the RCS. I'm also keeping the thrust fairly low so I don't induce too much torque when the wobbling starts to happen. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> that was our periapsis going into Kerbin as we flip this orbit around. That should fix itself as we get towards the end of the burn. But as I was saying, like the wobble's going to happen anyway. But the higher you have your thrust, the more torque you're going to induce. And then that's going to compound on your wobble. So just being very, very cautious here. And yes, it does take patience. But this is not a time critical burn when you're this far out away from uh, your parent body. Uh, you can just take your time. It doesn't matter how long you take with it. But we're coming to the tail end of it here. Oh heck, we're close. This is close enough. Let's just cut it. Alright, we'll get rid of the maneuver node here. We'll let this thing tumble. Let's see what we got. Ooh, that looks pretty good. Nice intersection with Minmus's orbit. Plane looks good. 
Okay, let's put a maneuver node down here at Periapsis, see if we can not get ourselves an encounter. Oh, we got an encounter. Those close encounter indicators are pretty close right away. Nice. Okay, let's put in a little bit of retrograde. Okay, that's way too much. This isn't going to take... Oh, there's our intersection. So this isn't going to take too much to get ourselves an encounter with Minmus. Let's focus in here on Minmus and we will tweak this. According to Kerbal Engineer, I still have 225 meters per second left in the vessel. That should be able to get me my capture fairly easily, in fact. Turned out, though, that this encounter is going to be 27 days from now. So I don't think we're going to be encountering it in this episode. No, it's going to have to be for a future episode. Until then, I thank you for watching and hope to see you again next time.